everybody. It's another pandemic cast for you. Welcome to the first and maybe uh, maybe more episodes of Das Das, a special podcast that wherein uh, we explore a frankly much forgotten era of video gaming, the PC gaming era of the late 1980s, much of the 90s. This is this is an era of gaming that often tends to be. Uh, forgotten in the grand scheme of things among all the consoles and stuff but a lot of people tend to forget that some of the biggest franchises of all time like doom and quake and so many others half-life they all started in pc games i have with me uh i have with me someone that uh frankly i don't think i could do this thing without i don't think i could do this pilot episode without someone who grew up with pc games just as i did my own brother glenn martin Hello. So, do you have anything you want to add to what I was saying, real quick? Uh, just about like we both grew up with PC gaming before consoles, like more than anything. Yes, definitely. There was, in fact, we were uh, expressly forbidden from owning consoles. I don't remember the exact rationale why. Um, I think part of it had to do with the fact that uh, our dad came across a lot of discarded tech, being working as he did as a software engineer. So. I suppose we're a bit privileged in the fact that we both uh, we both had our own PCs by the time at the time in uh, he, at a time in history when people were lucky to have a single PC for the home. I don't know how true this is, but I feel like there was also kind of a feeling of like if they're going to be playing if they're going to be playing these games and just sort of whittling away the hours, just doing this mindless stuff. We might as well also give them a thing that will allow them to do word processing and spreadsheets and things like that. Another, you know, more useful and, you know, marketable computer sort of things. And I think another part of it was probably the fact that there was the uh, shareware movement going on at the time. Right. Where right. there was, it's probably a lot more common even on consoles now where you get a portion of the game to start with, so to. Uh, generate interest in a title. In the Shearware era, this was often escalated quite a bit. Uh, you gave the examples of Doom and Quake. Like you, In those cases, you would get a third of the game before you would have to be forced to decide, do I want to pay to continue playing this? In, in, in many ways, like the whole Shareware movement was really kind of revolutionary for its time in terms of you know game sharing before there was like pay what you want and all these other things. And it's definitely going to play a huge part of the story we're going to be talking about today. Absolutely. So uh, you think we should just start getting into it? Go right ahead. Depending on how well this episode turns out, we will probably be doing more cuz like this is like I have, we haven't even recorded this yet and already I've ex like a lot of my friends have expressed interest in you know episodes on other, you know, franchises moving forward. That'll be fascinating to hear other perspectives, because I keep say, cause I, I keep coming across people who have nostalgia for parts for the early console era of the Nintendo and the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo, which was n not what we were doing at the time. I the thing that keeps coming to mind is my nostalgia is not your nostalgia, and I'm interested in seeing these stories of other people's nostalgia. I, I am too. So like for me it's always very fascinating when we do when like we do come across someone who also like came up in that specific era just because all these other consoles have just taken center stage so much. But anyway, for this inaugural episode we're going to be talking we're going to be tell, basically telling the story of a franchise that is not only one of the formative, you know, video game franchises of both of our youths um, in many ways, it also sort of tells the story of the inception of id Software, one of the most important uh, PC gaming, uh, one of the most important PC gaming companies probably ever. But anyway, the franchise we're going to be talking about today is Commander Keen. <laughs> What is the Commander Keen franchise? It's a very early sort of side-scrolling platforming game for the PC, which, I mean, for reasons we'll explain a little bit later, like, there were not many platformers on the PC at the time that Commander Keen came out, or at the very least, not many successful ones. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, a tech... It's, it was technical issues that were holding back uh, platformers on PC. 
because if you look at the hardware, cont the contemporary hardware, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, those hardware, pieces of hardware were primarily sprite-based. So they could do the kind of quick sprite movements and background scrolling effects that were necessary for smoothness in a platformer. Yeah, not, not just that, but those consoles were made specifically for that purpose, unlike, unlike a PC or an Apple computer. By contrast, uh, the IBM PC started its life, uh, as the name suggests, as a business machine. The idea of putting games on it was not a consideration when it was first in conceived in 1981. So the fact that uh, someone comes along and decides to put games on it is always going to be a little bit out of the intended mainstream for that. If you wanted to do something heavy on sprites, you not only would you have to do it all in software, so which would have a lot of a huge amount of CPU processing overhead. Yeah, but anyway, the Commander Keen franchise, um, as I mentioned, early platforming game, there were, in some total, in some total there were approximately four official games attached to the franchise, two of which were comprised of multiple episodes. One consisted of three episodes, one consisted of two episodes, there was a standalone game, and another semi-official standalone game that we'll talk about a little later. There were other games under the Commander Keen brand, but they weren't necessarily completely tied to the main crew that developed them in the first place. No, I think that a lot of these... There were a few other Commander Keen games, and I don't think the uh, character and series creator Tom Hall had much to do with these other games. Uh, Tom Hall himself, I believe, has said in many interviews that he's expressed an interest in bringing the Commander Keen franchise back, but he's been stymied by id Software, who still hold on to the rights to the character and won't give it back. There was also an attempt at creating a kind of spiritual successor, uh, which he started a Kickstarter Right, for. there was that Kickstarter. Worlds of Wander, I believe that was. And... I don't recall, I don't think the Kickstarter was successful. Yeah, I believe the Kickstarter was not successful, but after its failure, Tom Hall said he would work on the game on his own time. I'm not really sure if any other news came out after that. Right, I don't think I've heard anything about that since. The inception of the Commander Keen franchise can be traced back to a Shreveport, Louisiana-based software company called Soft Disk Inc. Founded in 1981 and defunct as of 2006, it acted as both a developer and publisher of DOS-based computer games, as well as games of various early Apple computers and the Commodore 64. It also acted as the curator of a monthly disc magazine called Big Blue Disc, which contained shareware demos of games. This lasted from about 1986 to 1989, when it was sued by IBM over usage of the name Big Blue. Beyond all this, though, Soft Disk Inc. is probably best known for the employees that formerly worked there including one of the primary creators of Commander Keen himself, as we mentioned, a Wisconsin-born programmer and comp sci graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison named Tom Hall, who took a job with Soft Disk in 1987 working in the Apple II department as a programmer and editor on big blue disc games, like Duck Boop. You all remember Duck Boop, right? Oh yeah, that's that game where you boop the ducks and... Yes. <laughs> And you get points for booping said duck. You can tell I've played this game, right? No. Oh, yes. We've all played duck boop. I'm sure there's all kinds of hilarious boops and beeps on PC speaker. Oh, yes. That was a very... That was a that was one booping-ass PC speaker. A big, a big turning point for Tom Hall came in 1989, when up-and-coming Colorado programmer John Romero joined Soft Disk to work in its special projects division for the IBM PC. Romero very quickly inured himself to the company, having an already impressive resume to his name. Having done programming for a variety of Commodore 64 games like 2400 AD, Space Rogue, and the system's port of Might and Magic 2, and he very quickly struck up a quick rapport with Tom Hall. The games that Romero contributed to at Soft Disk attracted the attention of another freelance programmer, Kansas City native John Carmack, who at the time was working at a pizza parlor and programming games on the side. But Romero's work intrigued Carmack enough to pursue a career at Soft Disk as well, who were also impressed with Carmack's work and hired him on the spot to work in the same IBM division as Romero, where he also befriended Hall. 
Johns Romero and Carmack immediately developed their own partnership and set to working together on a smattering of titles, to which Tom Hall also contributed. At Softdisk, there was a rule in place that employees were not permitted to work together if they were assigned to separate departments, so oftentimes Hall, who was assigned to the Apple department, had to sneak in after hours in order to be able to collaborate with the two Johns of the PC department. It was also during this time that Romero and Carmack were put in charge of managing Gamer's Edge, a bi-monthly collection of shareware software for the DOS platform with another key player, the graphic artist Adrian Carmack, unrelated to John. I didn't do a lot of research into Gamer's Edge, but it sounds very similar to uh, the Selectware system uh, thing that we had as kids. Yeah, at the time, I'm sure there were probably very many uh, subscription-based, uh, possibly attached to a magazine with a cover disc systems involved. There was also like that one, like we just found it at Building 19 when it was around, that one CD that advertised like 2,000 2, shareware games, and it just had this huge selection of shareware titles you could play. I forget what it was called. But you 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 know what I'm talking about, right? I think I know which one you're t referring to. Yeah, I'll see if I, I I'll have to see if I can find that one. I'm sure I have it somewhere. Yeah, that would be interesting to note. Um. So anyway, right now in our timeline, it's around 1990. In September of this year, a major breakthrough was reached when John Carmack developed a method of implementing side-scrolling video games on personal computers. At the time, as we mentioned, side-scrollers were seen as exclusively do the domain of home console systems, which had more refined and dedicated hardware for gaming than PCs. PC games previously had to sacrifice graphical power in order to be able to have the necessary processing speed, which during the CGA era, or Color Graphics Adapter, involved redrawing a screen from top to bottom per screen, and PCs just didn't have the processing power to keep up with fast-paced side-scrolling action. So no Mario's, no Metroid's, none of that on the PC. But John Carmack's adaptive tile refresh technique allowed for extra performance power by tracking graphical elements and only redrawing them as needed, which freed up a lot of processing power. And this was, I mean, obviously it wasn't, you know, it hadn't reached a, it hadn't reached the masses yet while he was working at Softdisk, but this was this was set to be something very revolutionary for PC computers. Uh, you can. Uh, you might actually be about to talk about this, but the first implementation, there's this story going on where Romero had been working on a number of titles which featured the character of Dangerous Dave. Oh yes, there's, there's kind of a funny story about how Dangerous Dave came into being. Uh, John Carmack initially showed the technique to Tom Hall, and his first instinct was to use it to pull a prank on John Romero. Um, over the course of a single night, Hall and Carmack used the new graphical technique to reproduce the first level of the Nintendo platforming game Super Mario Bros. 3, pixel by pixel. But in Mario's place was a character of their own creation, the aforementioned Dangerous Dave. The final game was titled Dangerous Dave in Copyright Infringement, which they committed to a disc and left it on John Romero's desk, and then left the soft disc offices around 5 in the morning. With a post-it note on it that said, Run me reputedly. To their surprise, however, Romero was fascinated by Dangerous Dave and its uses of adaptive tile refreshing, and saw immense commercial potential for Hall and Carmack's prank. Romero took the demo and with Hall and Carmack presented it to Softdisk's project manager Jay Wilbur, who also saw dollar signs. So he encouraged them to produce a full demo out of their program. In addition to Hall, Carmack, and Romero and Wilbur, Lane Roth, an editor for Gamer's Edge, also took on the project with them. It took them 72 hours, but by then they had produced a prototype, which they took straight to Nintendo with the prospect of using it to produce a PC port of Super Mario Bros. 3. As I understand it, the port did manage to reach some of the highest echelons of Nintendo, but they ultimately turned it down because it's Nintendo. They've always been notoriously protective of their own intellectual properties. And I guess they just didn't see it as anything other than a franchise for Nintendo consoles. I mean, yeah, why would you share when you're already at the peak of your power? Yeah, this, this would have been like peak Nintendo around the time it came out. This setback was short to last, however. At the same time they were attempting to get Nintendo in their corner, John Romero had been receiving a peculiar amount of fan letters for games he'd been working on with Softdisk, letters that all seemed to be coming from the same address in Garland, Texas. After some digging, Romero found the source of the letters, one Scott Miller of Apogee Software, 
a pioneer in the shareware model of computer game distribution. Apogee Software, again, the home of a lot of PC-era franchises that, like Apogee Software, would later become 3D Realms, which their main claim to fame was the Duke Nukem franchise, and that was pretty huge when it came out. But even before the Duke Nukem franchise, uh, there are so many other titles from Apogee that could be episodes here in their own right. Oh, for sure. So many that are and mem- that are nostalgic memories for the both of us. But anyway, uh, Scott Miller from Apogee contacted Romero, professing to be a big fan of their soft disc games, and wanted them to produce shareware games for Apogee. Uh, initially interested in another Romero game, Catacombs, Miller very quickly caught wind of the makeshift Super Mario game and offered to finance the creation of a full game. Romero accepted, and after recruiting Adrian Carmack to provide graphic design, the team was off and running using every scrap of free time they could muster to work on their game for Apogee, while programming for Softdisk during the daytime. Uh, Softdisk, who after being rejected by Nintendo, were uninterested in pursuing John Carmack's adaptive tile refreshing any further, which probably a huge mistake on their part, in retrospect. Uh, The team, who at the time referred to themselves as Ideas from the Deep, pressed on, with Tom Hall in the role of designer and creative director, John Carmack and Romero as programmers, Adrian Carmack as graphic designer, and Jay Wilbur as team manager. Lane Roth also came along to contribute, but was later kicked out by Romero, who thought his work ethic wasn't up to snuff. Uh, They spent every available opportunity not spent at Softdisk from October to December of 1990 working on their game. Their dedication was such that during one night of development, a heavy storm flooded roads that led to the house that they were sharing, where development primarily took place. Romero went so far as to wade through a flooded river in order to get to the house. At the same time, Scott Miller was hard at work marketing the game on message boards and game magazines that he had access to. Commander Keen Invasion of the Vorticons saw completion in the afternoon of December 14th, at which point Miller immediately began uploading the first episode to BBS websites, offering the full game, consisting of three episodes across three floppy disks, for $30. Invasion of the Vorticon's three episodes, Marooned on Mars, The Earth Explodes, and Keen Must Die, featured the adventures of the titular Commander Keen, the secret identity of eight-year-old boy genius Billy Blaze. In his efforts to thwart the alien Vorticon's attack on planet Earth, and eventually face off against their master, the mysterious Grand Intellect. Uh, Much of the aesthetics that came to define the game were influenced heavily by Hall's own personal experiences and philosophies. Uh, He was a huge fan of science fiction, particularly Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century, Looney Tunes' own parody of the famed serial Buck Rogers. The Wisconsin resident also represented his home state through Kane's signature Green Bay Packers football helmet, which Kane was almost never seen without. Uh, Much of the design was also cribbed from Super Mario Bros. 3, including its non-linear exploration and secrets in hidden areas, such as its iconic standard galactic alphabet, which hid coded messages across the various levels of the game. Uh, Deviated from Mario's core mechanics, however, with two key features of its main character, Billy Blaze, Commander Keen's secret identity. A blaster pistol and a pogo stick. Right out the gate, Commander Keen was a resounding smash both commercially and critically, receiving high praise from PC publications of the time such as PC World and PC Magazine, as well as the famed fantasy magazine Dragon. On top of all of this, the game was a major sales success for Apogee, who previously had been managing sales in the range of $7,000 a month. Upon Keen's release, that number spiked up to $30,000 a month, and later $60,000 a month. Its success allowed Scott Miller to quit his then-day job and move Apogee from his house into an office, and even recruit his mother to handle sales and phone calls from interested players. So clearly, Commander Keen was really not just take like the game was not just taking off, but it was causing Apogee and other, it was causing Apogee and the ideas from the Deep Crew to take off as well. So of course this would be the seed money that would uh, eventually lead to Wolfenstein and in turn to Doom. Right. Uh, Once Ideas from the Deep received their first royalty check from sales of Invasion of the Vorticons, that's when they realized they no longer needed to work at Softdisk and could develop their own games full-time. It was around then that John Carmack was confronted by Softdisk CEO Al Vakovius, who had caught on to their programming behind the company's back and utilizing their resources. 
Carmack was incapable of lying and admitted up front that they not only used soft disk resources to make the game, but he felt no remorse for their actions and had been planning on quitting to form their own company. Softdisk had come to rely on their Gamer's Edge service and tried to negotiate with John Carmack, Adrian Carmack, Romero, Hall, and Wilbur to form their own company in partnership with Softdisk. After much discussion, the team agreed to produce several games in obligation to Softdisk, which included notable shareware titles like Hover Tank 3D and Catacomb 3D, games which served as some of the earliest progenitors to the first-person shooter genre. They also produced Keen Dreams while there which was not officially a canonical uh, Commander Keen game, but was utilized as a prototype to develop new ideas for their next Keen-related effort. As such, Keen Dreams, contained refined <coughs> Keen Dreams contained refined gameplay mechanics, graphical enhancements, and parallax scrolling, all of which Invasion of the Vorticons lacked. But despite all this, the game was not widely played or regarded at the time because it was released through such a small, a small publisher. Nowadays, it's considered a lost episode in the Commander Keen franchise, and would later find new life in re-releases of the Commander Keen series. It even received its own Nintendo Switch port in 2019 from Lone Wolf Technology. They've been calling it a lost episode since only a few years after uh, it was released. It's been well, like, it's like, it may have not been, you know, an official id software title, but it's been well accepted by fans long enough. I feel like... Uh, yeah, I, I think ultimately the whole lost episode shtick was really just a marketing gimmick. Yeah, and for, like, the longest time, it was not included in... It was not included among, like... There, there's there been multiple reissues and re-releases of the Keen titles on Steam and other platforms. Right. The Steam release has episodes one through five, and... Keen Dreams got a release only much later when they decided to go back and give it the uh, remake treatment. I was actually playing the complete Keen collection on Steam in preparation to record this. It still holds up, by the way. All that's included are Invasion of the Vorticons the next, and the next game, which amounts to five episodes in total. No Keen Dreams and no uh, none of the other episode that we'll get into a bit later, which has its own reasons for not being on there. <laughs> By September of 1991, the ideas from the Deep Team had fulfilled their obligations to Softdisk and took their leave, exiting Shreveport for Tom Hall's home of Madison, Wisconsin, to begin anew. After their departure, Softdisk would shift from software development to being a local internet service provider, before eventually being bought out and merged into the local service Bayou Internet in 2006. Much of their Gamer's Edge titles would later be bought out by GOG.com, while the source code for Catacombs, Catacomb 3D, and Hover Tank 3D, considered their biggest releases apart from Keem Dreams, would be re-released under the GNU General Public License. Though Softdisk eventually sputtered out and collapsed, Ideas from the Deep would flourish to this day under their new banner, id Software. id Software, named after the part of the Freudian psyche. Uh, particularly, id is often associated with... Uh, for one thing, pleasure seeking, which makes it a perfect title for a for a, for a recreational game company, series, game developer site. Yeah. By 1991, Carmack, as well as programmer John Romero, designer Tom Hall, and artist Adrian Carmack, had exited Soft Disk Inc. and set up shop in Madison, Wisconsin, leaving their manager Jay Wilbur behind, who decided he couldn't afford to abandon the steady work at Soft Disk. He would later eventually join ID as their business manager. Along the way, they also picked up a programmer, Jason Blachowiak, another former Softdisk employee, and Mark Rain, a fan from Canada whom Romero had kept in contact with that offered to playtest the game and was later brought on in a marketing role. Upon settling in Wisconsin, they set up headquarters in a three-bedroom apartment, which they spent increasingly more time in as the Midwestern winters grew colder and colder. Nonetheless, the team worked tirelessly to produce a Commander Keen sequel series to follow Invasion of the Vorticons. Seeking more than just a graphical update, the id Software team found a variety of means to polish up their sequel. John Carmack, having initially tested the waters of improving upon his adaptive tile technique on Keen Dreams, took this opportunity to incorporate parallax scrolling into the game, which would allow the background of a given level to scroll at a different rate than the foreground, which was unheard of on a PC side-scrolling title at the time. To accomplish this, he developed a system where combinations of overlapping foreground and background elements were stored in the game's memory to be withdrawn at specific moments when Keen was on screen, which meant the game would only have to choose the correct image to display rather than recalculate what it would look like every time. 
This may seem like a mundane feature of PC gaming nowadays, but at the time, it was quite, it was quite remarkable. The parallax scrolling would also be incredibly necessary to work alongside the game's skewed pseudo-3D perspective, which utilized side-on-view ramps and surfaces rather than the flat platforms of Invasion of the Vorticons. Tom Hall, meanwhile, had received feedback from parents about the release of Vorticons, uh, who were unhappy with the prevalence of enemy corpses in the game, whereas most platforming side-scrollers simply caused the enemies to disappear entirely. With Keen Dreams at soft disk, Hall skirted this complaint by giving Keen a pellet-throwing attack, which would temporarily stun enemies. Parents were satisfied with this change, but Hall was not. While trying to figure out a way to take Commander Keen slash Billy Blaze's parents out of the storyline entirely, he hit upon the idea of giving Keen his iconic stun gun, which would have the same effect on Keen's prior blaster pistol, minus the Specter of Mortality. Uh, this sequel would also be the first in the franchise to feature a musical soundtrack composed by freelance sound designer Bobby Prince, who would go on to be a frequent collaborator with id Software. Prince originally had planned to include music on Keen Dreams, even coming up with a cinematic piece to play over the title screen. This was left out of the final product, though, due to a lack of disc space. I would have loved to have heard that. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's available anywhere, but he had, like, an entire... Like, he had an entire thing arranged and just sort of synced up to an actual, you know, an actual sort of cinematic animation of sorts. I think that we probably could have, that uh, Keen might have gotten a little bit more longevity if he had a theme song. Yeah, probably. This does kind of make me wonder, though, since Keen Dreams was ported to the Switch a while ago, if maybe, like, that meant they finally could have, you know, given that a reality. Anyway, in this case, Prince had the freedom of space to create his soundtrack, which he did utilizing the iMuse system, which had been developed by LucasArts and had previously found usage in their point-and-click adventure games. It wasn't long before the first game in this new series, titled Goodbye Galaxy, would come to fruition. Episode 4 of this franchise, titled Secret of the Oracle, which was released as free shareware to spur interest in purchasing the other two episodes that would be a part of this latest trilogy, or at least that was the original plan. Not long after Mark Rain was brought onto the team to handle marketing duties, he managed to finagle a deal with the shareware company FormGen to sell the third game in the proposed trilogy as a separate retail product, as a means of breaking id Software into the commercial market. It were convinced to sign the deal, much to Scott Miller of Apogee Software's dismay. He believed that not having a full trilogy would hurt sales of Goodbye Galaxy in the long run. Nonetheless, Goodbye Galaxy was released on December 15, 1991. It consisted of two episodes, the aforementioned Secret of the Oracle and the Armageddon Machine. It once again followed the adventures of Commander Keen as he attempted to foil a, a uh, far-reaching plot to destroy the galaxy and rebuild it in their own image. Similar to Invasion of the Vorticons, Goodbye Galaxy received high marks from publications of the time, like Dragon and PC Zone, in particular praising the graphics, gameplay, and humor, and declaring it one of the finest side-scrolling platformers to have ever seen release on the PC. And this is roughly where we come in, because I think I recall that Commander Keen Episode 4, Secret of the Oracle, was probably one of the first computer games that I've ever played on IBM PC. Right, likewise. It was certainly the first in the Commander Keen franchise that we ever played. I believe we didn't discover the original uh, Invasion of the Vorticons episodes until much later. No, that, yeah, that came later because it, you know, we were, I think, four or five years old at the time, and we, were just, we had just been supplied a computer by our dad. He said, yeah, yeah. Here's a, here's a DOS computer. You want to play computer games? Here, use this. This wasn't the Amiga, was it? No, no. This was, I think it was a 386. I don't recall anything more about what the hardware was. Uh, but it was running DOS and Windows 3.1, and it had a Sampo AlphaScan CRT monitor on it. Because we definitely played computer games on the Amiga before we got the 386. Oh, yeah. But... Uh, I, I don't I don't know if this was... I definitely also remember the games that we did play on the Amiga being a bit more primitive than what we eventually got to play on the IBM computer. I mean, yes, the, the, Amiga, game, the Amiga games, I remember at least, were uh, a lot more skewed towards edutainment because we were even younger uh, then playing the Amiga games than we were when we finally switched over to an IBM PC. Right. I don't recall... I don't know if that was due to... Uh, dad being an Amiga 
partisan or if this was for work-related reasons. Could have been. For background, uh, Dad worked a number of IT jobs, and it was one of the reasons we grew up in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, because he had taken a job at Wang Laboratories, which had just opened up their uh, 14-story office park in Lowell, Massachusetts which is now the uh, cross point towers since Wang vacated it. I do not know for sh- is Wang Computers still around as a company or are they pretty much No, no, they went they went bankrupt only a few years after dad took that job. Ah, okay. And it's in yeah, and and it's in this context that um I don't remember if the uh, computers we got were cast offs from uh development at Wang, but uh it's probably what it was. Uh, getting back to Secret of the Oracle, it's also particularly noteworthy for introducing the video gaming world to the Dopefish, an enemy in the game that appeared in a single level but has been descri- and has been described by Tom Hall as just a stupid green fish, and yet it's become one of the longest-running in-jokes in the entirety of the video gaming industry. Games like Quake, Duke Nukem 3D, Daikatana, Red Faction, Max Payne, Hitman 2, Alan Wake, Rage, and Deus Ex Human Revolution are just a handful of the many games this creature has made non-sequitur cameos in as a hidden Easter egg and continues to appear in games as recently as 2020. The dope fish is IBM PC Gaming's Kilroy. Yeah, kind of. Just the sort of thing that'll just pop up out of nowhere and... You know, people who are in the like people who aren't in the know will just sort of look at it with furrowed eyebrows. But you know, those who are around at the time will just go, ah, that thing. <laughs> um, in contrast to Invasion of the Vorticons, Goodbye Galaxy was not the major shareware sales blockbuster that the former was. Sources have stated that Galaxy sales amounted to about a third of Invasions, with much of the blame focused squarely on their decision to break up the trilogy, which undercut the shareware model they had come up in. Despite this, Goodbye Galaxy still managed to be one of the top shareware sellers of 1992, according to distributors. This might have, I mean, the fact that they were still a big seller might have also been, had something to do with the fact that shareware was very slowly starting to head out the door by that point. Like, I mean, how long did the shareware model last? That's something that I don't have on hand right now. Like, did it go into the mid-90s, or? Well, the idea of keeping, of offering a pre-trial game persisted well into the 2000s. I don't remember when they stopped calling it shareware and calling it just demos or something. I know that the concept never really went away. They just stopped branding te- these uh, trial versions as shareware. Thinking about it now, like, I mean, obviously demos have existed Long, long before. I mean, with shareware, it was just, you know, like usually, like how we've come to understand demos of like a computer game or a video game is you get to play, you know, one or two levels from the game and that's it. But with the shareware model, at least in Commander Keen's case, you had an entire third of the game. So you were getting a pretty sizable chunk. And it actually just reminded me um, when Telltale... When Telltale Games were still around and a major sort of force, uh, when they were first getting their legs into episodic gaming, um, they kind of relied on a very similar shareware model for a bit because they would make the for like much of for like several of their franchises like the Sam and Max game and Strong Bad's Cool Games for attractive people. They would just make the first game in the franchise just totally free, and all the other episodes you would need to pay for or just buy as like a combo pack. So it, so I guess in that sense, you know, shareware didn't totally go away. No, it just rebranded, I think. But anyway, as for the vaunted third episode of the trilogy that got sold away to form gen, the sixth game in the franchise would be released in tandem with Goodbye Galaxy in December of 1991 under the title Aliens Ate My Babysitter. And despite being the sixth in the franchise chronologically, was actually put into development before the Armageddon machine. In Aliens, Commander Keen finds himself embroiled in a quest to save his teenage babysitter who was kidnapped by aliens, as implied, but not explicitly stated that the game takes place after the events of Goodbye Galaxy. Much of the same hallmarks of galaxies are present in Aliens, including the parallax scrolling, enhanced graphics, and Sound Blaster soundtrack from Bobby Prince. That's another one that was also sort of formative for us, like immediately after uh, Secret of the Oracle 
which I mean, we we skipped over. We ended up skipping over the fifth episode, the Armageddon Machine. Right, but we got it. We got a retail copy of Aliens, and uh, that was the only Keen uh, I should note to come with copy protection. Yeah, and like Keen fans weren't necessarily used to that, so that could have been another. That could have been another sort of thing that drove fans away from the franchise a little bit more. Uh, like Galaxy, Aliens enjoyed critical praise upon its release. Unlike Galaxy, whose sales were already below expectations, Aliens sold exceptionally poorly by comparison. As with before, the fact that it was separated from what was originally a trilogy was singled out as a defining factor. Other factors included the copy protection, which no previous Keen game have. Probably rubbed longtime fans the wrong way. And uh, the design team themselves pointed to the marketing, which had some pretty poor decisions, including the game's box art, which had been designed by a company whose resume also included the packaging for Lipton Tea. The id, the id Software team despised it. Yeah, that was a weird box cover. It was going for a more kind of realistic kind of look. There was definitely nothing... I mean, it was always there was always kind of a cartoonish feel to the Commander Keen games, and yet here's this... Uh, looks looking more like a, the cover of a YA novel. The cover art, I think you can find it on Google Images, but it's basically like almost kind of movie poster like. Just this, you know, it's the 90s, so there's this too cool for school looking kid in a football helmet with a blaster, just standing looking like a Star Wars prop. Yeah, looking like a Star Wars prop, prop with just a very smug look on his face, and in the background, just a tiny version of him facing off against. Uh, a Bloog, one of the enemies in the Commander Keen franchise, who just looks like a Bloog. So you've got this hyper-realistic, you've got this hyper-realistic kid in a oversized football helmet facing off against this gigantic green blob with one eye and a club. Imagine Mike Wazowski if he worked out. <laughs> Something like that. And had chicken feet. Despite Alien's comparatively lesser success, uh, though it still managed to be a higher seller among a high seller among software distributors. Sales were still strong enough that id would return to form Gen to distribute more of their developed titles. Aliens Ate My Babysitter had ended on a cliffhanger that promised a new Commander Keen trilogy in 1992, under the title The Universe is Toast. It never came to fruition, however. The id team did work on such a game for a few weeks, but gradually shifted focus to other projects, in particular the famed first-person shooter prototype, Wolfenstein 3D. Tom Hall had proposed picking the series back up after Wolfenstein's completion, but by that time, the team's focus had shifted onto another FPS that would come to define id, Doom. Id focused primarily on 3D shooting games afterwards and would not develop any more games in the Commander Keen franchise. In spite of this, other Commander Keen games did see development. In 2001, Activision affiliate David A. Palmer Productions developed a Game Boy Advance title simply called Commander Keen in collaboration with id Software, who had final approval over game design elements and additional tile artwork from Adrian Carmack, but otherwise were pretty hands-off. David Palmer, who was a longtime admirer of id's games, had long been trying to reach an agreement between Activision and id for years to port several of their original games to the handheld system. Uh, the 2001 Commander Keen game, which was billed as a game based on the original series, was released to middling scores and reviews who uh, praised the adaptation of Keen's old-school side-scrolling graphical, uh, side graphical gameplay, but criticized the graphics and art style, as well as the limitations of the Game Boy Advance, which frequently made levels a slog. I have not, yeah, I haven't played the uh, Game Boy Advance Keen at all. Yeah, I have, neither have I. Not real, well, not, maybe not not at all, but... Oh, yeah? I've dabbled in it a little bit. I've gotten an emulator and a ROM and played it a little bit on PC, and it, the feel is completely different. The controls are the control. It's the controls are not well adapted to a two-button system, and we kind of already knew that with the because the first one, if you try playing it, your gamepad options for a PC in the early days were not very wide, and I recall we had some kind of a two-button gamepad joystick. Oh yeah, we did have a gamepad at one point. Yeah, and trying to play Commander Keen with that was not as good, it was not as responsive as doing so uh, on a keyboard. I mean, in some ways, Commander Keen was technically a two-button game at its very core sort, at its very core sort of basics, like 
You press control to jump. You press alt to use the pogo stick. And you have control and alt to shoot the gun. But then I get... But now, no, that, never mind. That's not true because you also need all the other keys to open the menu, look at your status, and all that sort of stuff. But I suppose it's such the case that you, if you really wanted to, you could control the game with an NES controller. Yeah, that's true. Because you, you can assign the other options to select and start, and uh, that might be owing to... That might be a, a relic of the fact that they were trying to sell the prior prototype mm. to Nintendo. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Anyway, that was 2001. There was pretty much dead silence in terms of the Commander Keen franchise for many years. Until 2019, at Bethesda Softworks' E3 conference, it was announced that there would be a new Commander Keen game for mobile devices, intended to be a total reboot that would take the game away from its side-scrolling roots and incorporate tactical strategy elements and multiplayer capability. Because that sounds great! Oh, yeah. Commander Keen, the stars. Commander Keen, can you read us from Mars? Commander Keen, the generation. Commander Keen, Commander Keen. A, a Keen mobile game, that's sure to be, you know... In all seriousness, I'm sure faithful. that, you know, it, you could make such a thing work. It's possible, but... They did not. No, they did not. But you could. Uh, the trailer prominently featured main characters Billy and Billy Blaze, it's spelled differently, twin son and daughter of the original Commander Keen as its protagonists. The trailer was released to intense negative reaction from Commander Keen fans and was announced for a summer 2019 release, but as of this date in 2020, no official release or news has been made by Bethesda which is probably for the better. As I recall, uh, Lazy Game Reviewer, a YouTube channel that I've been following... Yeah, I, I, presu I presume you've seen the trailer. I haven't seen the... I think I may have seen the trailer for the Keen game, but I saw uh, LGR at uh, the at Bethesda's booth. I believe he posted a like a 10-second video that just consisted of him walking up, taking one look over and going, Nope! <laughs> yeah, I would say that's just about all the reaction one would need for something like that. By 1993, the co-creators of Commander Keen gradually began to go their separate ways and drift into other projects. Tom Hall would be forced to resign from it after a dispute with John Carmack over the design for Doom, and after leaving, hi after leaving it, he would go on to work for Apogee Software. While he was there, Hulp helped produce games like Rise of the Triad, Terminal Velocity, and Duke Nukem 3D. John Romero continued to work at id, leaving his designer's mark on key PC franchises like Doom and Quake. He would later be fired from id after Quake's release for not performing up to snuff. He would later co-found Ion Storm Studio with Tom Hall, a company infamous for its lavish expenses and for producing the infamously bad Dai Katana, but also critically acclaimed games like Anachronox and Deus Ex. Adrian Carmack remained with id until 2005 when he left the company, initially declaring that he wanted to devote himself to his passions of art, but it would later be revealed that he had been fired in an attempt to purchase his stake in the company. Adrian Carmack would sue his former employers, but the lawsuit would be dropped after id Software was acquired by the holding company, Zenimax Media, in 2009. John Carmack stuck with id the longest out of any of the co-founders who'd worked on Keen. Along the way, developing important technology used in id games like Doom and Quake, as well as licensing technology to franchises like Half-Life and Call of Duty. He remained with id until 2013, when he left of his own accord to work for Oculus VR as their CTO until 2019 when he stepped down from his position to focus on his new passion, developing artificial general intelligence programs. On the whole, it's kind of unfortunate to see a beloved franchise getting cut short without proper closure and with no proper end on the horizon. And as we've mentioned, Tom Hall has stated in numerous interviews his interest in picking the franchise up, but is just kind of being blackballed by id Software. In the meantime, however, Commander Keen's cult fan base has kept the original games alive decades after its inception. With reissues of the game frequently selling hundreds of thousands of copies on Steam, it boasts an incredibly robust modding community as well. One that would inevitably produce an, an unofficial version of the Universe's Toast trilogy decades after its original announcement. Were you, had you heard of this? Yes, I uh, have... I have uh, downloaded and briefly played uh, the three um, episodes 7, 8, and 9. I have not checked them out yet, but after I'm all finished doing my little deep dive play of the franchise, I'll definitely have to look those up. It's interesting. You can. Uh, it, it doesn't look like any new 
they haven't done anything to add any new code or anything, so there are no not really any new game features. And um, so there are new enemies, but it's just a reskin for the most part. So you've got a lot of enemies behaving very much the same as in pre... So you've got Episode 7, which features a lot of Episode 4 enemies. Their behavior is pretty much mimicked. And then 8 is aping 6, and 9 is aping 5. I mean, that that's very... That's kind of interesting. I think... I mean, these games didn't come out until around 2018, so I think for a lot of Keen fans, it was just... Well, my I forget exactly. It might not have been 2018. The point is it came out many, many years after the last Keen game. So I feel like for a lot of Keen fans, it was just more about getting some sort of closure than... Like, I, I can't I can't imagine, like, a lot of fans of the Keen franchise clamoring for, like, a 3D reboot of Keen or something like that. No, I, I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have... Uh, I wouldn't have stood for that. Maybe, just maybe, like, what Duke Nukem did, where, like, they had, like, that sort of... Like they had that sort of throwback game where they go back to the platforming games, but with you know jazzed up graphics and stuff like that. Manhattan Project. Yeah, Manhattan Project. Yeah, go, taking Keen to two and a half D, I think. Yeah, that that would be interesting. When when that was suddenly riding high, I thought that would have been a good time for Keen to try to make a reappearance. Yeah, I agree. Now, before we get into any other bits, you wanted to touch a little bit on, like, our specific experiences with Commander Keen. Um, just wanted to see if we had any, if you, if you had any stories to tell about your experiences playing the game. Uh, stories to tell. Uh, I like mean, what? Start from the begin. starting from the beginning, um, we always seem to be a lot more interested in the, the demo mode. Oh, yeah, yeah. To start with. Because this was... Uh, you know, I, at the time there was uh, arcade ga- arcade machines were probably still the pinnacle of gaming at the time. So the idea of having like this equivalent of an attract mode showing you what the gameplay was looking like right. probably made sense to do. I feel like maybe a part of it might have been like we were both very young when we started playing these games, and I think a part of us kind of knew that like. We are not very good at this game, and, like, we're probably not going to be very good at this game, but we would still like to experience it in some way. Right. And that and that probably, you know, made the demo mode seem a lot more enticing to us. I recall playing uh, the same... I recall starting a new game, playing the same uh, four levels that I knew how to beat, and then quitting repeatedly. Yeah, I remember like when I like whenever I would play the game cuz like this was one of the this was one of the this was an old like game where you could not only get points and a high score and put your score on a high scoreboard, but if you got enough points you would get an extra life. It was one of those old kind of games. I paid mm-hmm. little to no attention to that. I was just thinking like get to the end of the level and I'm golden. Right. Just beat it. Just beat it and you've beaten everything. Without any sort of thought, like, don't you want to, you know, look around? Don't you want to try to get more extra lives? Don't you want to try to get those points? Are you crazy? I might die. Yeah, then the game will be over. So excuse me while I try to make the game over of my own accord as quickly as possible. Probably owing to youth, but we were not particularly adventurous in terms of exploring. No. I'm not I'm not sure if, like, like, when we were young and still playing it on an IBM computer, I'm not sure if we ever actually beat... Like, we, like, I think there was a point where we beat Aliens Ate My Baby Shitter. I don't think we ever beat Secret of the Oracle. On the original hardware? No. I I think, I, I'm pretty sure that when I finally got around to beating uh, Secret of the Oracle, it was several years later. Yeah, me too. And, like, I can say for a fact we definitely never beat any of the original uh, Invasion of the Vorticon games. Like, ever. No, I think it was only, I think it was only once I got to the, uh, once, only once DOSBox had become prominent again did I resolve to eventually go back and beat right. those. And just speaking from my own experience replaying these games, uh, you know, in preparation for this podcast, I've managed to beat Secret of the Oracle, Armageddon Machine, Aliens Ate My Babysitter, and Marooned on Mars. Um, the other two chapters in the Invasion of the Vorticon games, uh, Keen Must Die and The Earth Explodes, they're fucking hard. 
They're really hard, like a lot harder than I remember. Yeah, Earth Explodes is a significant jump up in difficulty. Um, Keen Must Die is not so much uh, a uh, huge spike in difficulty as it's... The, the game world is incredibly hard to navigate. Yeah, it kind of is, because it introduced, like... It introduced these teleporters on, like, the world map that you yeah. traverse. So the overworld map is just a series of islands connected by yeah. teleporters. There were, teleporter and there were the teleporters, teleporters in on Mars, but they always went to one location. Yeah, they were always point to point. The teleporters in 3 are some kind of weird network where you enter a teleporter on one side and you, it... it it's not consistent where you'll end up on the other side. Yeah, it's it's definitely not something that either of us could have kept track of at the tender age of whatever age we at the tender at the tender single digit age that we were. Yeah, so what ended up happening is you would stand on top of one of the teleporters and press uh, the button to activate it and it's like and just hold it down and it's like, "Okay, is this where I want to go?" Nope. Is this where I'm going to go? Nope. Repeatedly until it's like Oh, wait, there it's right there. Oh, we've already teleported yeah. to the next one. What definitely made, you know, those two games especially harder, and, it, you know, this is a more retrospective kind of thing, but um, for the longest time, the first three games, like the controls were basically, you hit control, that makes you jump. You hit alt, that triggers the pogo stick. You hit control and alt, that shoots the gun. And that is, like, I can't tell you how many times since I've been playing that I've accidentally shot the gun while I've been trying to pogo stick. That is just, I mean, I understand, you know, hardware limitations of the time, but that is just an incredibly inefficient, you know, means of doing that. Right. It was with Episode 4 that they introduced the um, space bar to fire while also yeah, keeping uh, two-button firing as an option. and. Because that's where that's where we came in. So yeah, by that time I think we had gotten used to spacebar to fire, and so going back to the first one is like, wait, spacebar brings up the status menu. What's going on? In my replay, especially, I felt this weird sense of relief once you know, because I didn't end up beating two and three. I just ended up. I just thought like, well, if I keep trying to go through these fruitlessly as I as they get to, I won't be able to get to like you know the really good part the part that I was the most nostalgic for. And then once I get to four and the space bar fires, that felt like such a breath of fresh air to mm -hmm. me. Another thing about two that suddenly gave it a spike in difficulty was the fact that um, it has a schmuck bait insta game over in it. Yeah, that's right. Um, the whole sort of premise around the second game, uh, The Earth Explodes, is that Keen has infiltrated a Vorticon warship that's sort of hovering over the planet Earth with... Uh, with its big uh, wave motion gun pointed at Earth, and yeah. you have to turn off the weapon systems. And to do, that, to do that, you basically have to shoot a bit, like the little reactor core that's making it run. Right. Right underneath it, though, there's always a lever, where first first instinct, okay, I'd better pull that lever. Nope. Oh, this le yeah, here's a lever. What does this do? Oh, this fires the gun that you're trying to disable. Game over. Yeah. And what's even more insidious is that that reactor core is usually much higher than the the ground level. So you get up close to that wall and your first instinct is, well, I've got a pogo stick up there. But the thing is the alt button, which turns pogo stick on, also activates switches. Oh, jeez. That's not... So you have to stand back a little bit, otherwise you're going to accidentally flip the switch. The, uh, I think the level that finally made me just sort of rage quit 2 and move on to 3, um, I forget which city it was. I think I want to say it was Sydney that you need to save. Yeah, the... Right, the, 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 the premise is that... I, I don't know why they went with this, but... I guess it was just for flavor, but apparently there are uh, the Tantalus ray gun, or whatever it's called, is pointed at eight a major U.S. world, ma eight major world cities. It's just to make, just I suppose for a, as a point of reference. Okay, we're in the level where you save uh, S Sydney, New York, Sydney, New York, Paris, Paris Rome, D.C., that Moscow, kind of stuff. Munich. I don't think there was. I don't think there was Munich. Oh. Munich doesn't have a what 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 monument would rec would be uh, would uh, be represented in ASCII in uh, low pixel art. 
Because they always had a little screen in the background showing, okay, oh, there's Big Ben, so we know we're saving London here. There's the Opera House. There's the Sydney Opera House. There's the Eiffel Tower. Uh, there's a Munich Beer Garden. <laughs> and then when you finally uh, destroy the reactor core in that level, it goes staticky, which is a nice right. touch. But anyway, the level that finally made me rage quit, I, I want to say maybe it was the Sydney level. The thing about these reactor core levels is that they are much more heavily guarded, not just by just random level hazards, but by special varieties of enemies that not only take multiple hits to destroy, but also jump around a whole lot and can shoot back can shoot back at you. Right. Just 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 for frame of reference, let's go back to one. All right, sure. The enemies that can there's the there's enemies that can there's only a few enemies that can kill you. Yeah. There's only a few enemies There's that the, can kill you. There's only a few enemies that can kill you with projectiles also, to be more specific. Most of it is – there's a few – most of the danger is from the enemies that can push you into other things that will kill you that are uh, – that don't move. Yeah, it was a very level hazard-centric sort of level. I mean a sort of game. Right. And there were – there were only, I think, three or four Vorticons in the entire game, and they were only guarding – the important levels with the key items you need to repair right. your ship. The uh, premise of the first game is that, like the first chapter, Marooned on Mars, Keen just sort of takes his uh, takes I've his got a ship. Where he should I go? I'm going to Mars. He takes his rocket I to go Mars. I go explore. I come back to the ship. My ship parts are gone. Need to go find those. He just goes on a fun run, goes and discovers his ship parts are missing, so he needs to traverse the planet in order to get everything that he needs to get the. Uh, to get the ship back to Earth before his parents come home because... Um, because reasons. Because reasons. And in keeping with the uh, idea that, oh, this is an eight-year-old genius who built his ship out of, I believe the description mentions, built out of soup cans, rubber cement, and uh, something else. So the yeah, ship this, is also... This, this family eats too much soup. Yeah, so the ship is contains... Uh, is made out of some common household materials. It uses uh, a gaming joystick for a control yoke. It uses a car battery to power electrical systems. It uses uh, his mother's vacuum cleaner. Uh, for what purpose? I'm not quite sure. I think it's to be like a, a thruster focus of some kind. And the ship is powered by a bottle of Everclear. Right. How did, like... No one pick up on that. How did no government agency pick up on that and just be like, oh, my God, this amazing child prodigy yeah, figured yeah. out how to turn. That's, well, use of alcohol, that's a, a, at least an ESRB T rating. How, how, the, how to turn grain alcohol, what's basically grain alcohol, into a renewable fuel source. Right. To, n to not just, you know, power a vehicle, but one that can go into space. So with that as a, with that as a frame of reference, now you get to episode two. Um, and there are Vorticons, just rank-and-file yeah. Vorticons, everywhere. Well, you're on a Vorticon ship, so that's kind of assumed. Which, but, yeah, which makes sense. But yeah, like, thinking about it, it's going from the first game where there's only one enemy that ever shoots at you that are easy to avoid, to the second game where almost everything is shooting at you, and they're not only difficult to avoid, but a lot of them you either can't kill or... They're really difficult to kill. And the big Vorticon skill is that uh, they jump really high, so they're very hard to hit with your gun. They jump really high, and there's not really any sort of pattern to when they're going to shoot at you. Right. And for a lot of the reactor levels, there will often be these specialized Vorticons with blasters that take three or four hits to kill. I forget how many. I think four. In just huge chunks. Right. Two also... I've noticed has the distinction of being very stingy with ammo power-ups. Right. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of ammo in that game. Yeah. So I remember and getting I think to that. Three was even worse. So I remember getting to that point, barely having any ammo left, and just like four or five of those special blaster vorticons just sort of running around doing the little vorticon mosh pit and shooting at things. And I just thought, there's no fucking way, and skipped over to three. I forget what specifically mm -hmm. made me skip three. Two also introduced a mechanic that was not present in one, and they didn't carry over into three either, but apparently uh, 
light levels have an effect on Vorticon uh, AI. Right. Where if the lights are off, Vorticons will not jump. That was helpful for the one level that I managed to save a city. But then there was just no more li- there was just no more light switches for any of them. That only I can, yeah I can only think of like two or three places in the entire game where that actually uh, had an effect. That early in like the timeline of video gaming in general, I feel like that was that sort of era where there was a lot less you know emphasis as far as level design goes on actually letting people beat the game of their own accord. Yeah, this was not really intended to be like a heavily reusable element. It was more like, hey, that's an interesting gimmick. And it wasn't actually in the it wasn't actually uh explained in the manual. This was in that game there were these two Vorticon elders that were hidden at random points in the levels where if you find one, they would give you a level hint. They had those in the first game, too. I think there were just like right. little in the form statues of the, that you could... The Yorp statues, yes. They just had those in... Uh, they had those in episode two, and as far as I can tell, they don't really enter into the game like at all at any point. I mean, they offer like helpful hints like, oh, turn the lights off and Vorticons... Turn the lights off and Vorticons won't be able to jump. So I mean I guess that's handy. For the most part they're just doing world building. And the other the other hint was actually not a gameplay hint at all. It was more foreshadowing because they were tell- telling something about the grand intellect. I'm sure this isn't going to be like a spoiler alert thing, but it's eventually revealed in the third episode that the grand intellect that's controlling the Vorticons is actually Billy's classmate Mortimer. Yes. So yeah, moving moving forward to 3 um you said you never you never beat this one either. Was it because of the confusing teleporters? Was it the ammo shortage problem? I mean, I forget what specific episode. I forget what specific level made me rage quit, but I think it was a combination of all of those. And like with two, there was just a dearth of enemies that you know were difficult to kill and maneuver around. Though I noticed that a lot of the levels in that game were. Uh, strictly not necessary you could bypass a huge number of them so it was really more of how how much of a challenge did you want to take on thinking about it now i don't think it was so much like rage quitting as much as i thought yeah, this is taking what, what do i what the fuck do i do next yeah. that and i just thought this is taking too long i want to play commander keen 4 so bad right right cuz like 4 was i mean having like i mean the games in the first episode were good. In the first episode, first and second and third episodes were good, but it really didn't start to take off, you know, for me. And I'm sure there's a lot of nostalgia playing into this until the fourth episode, when the graphics were boosted. You could, like, there was the parallax scrolling, and you could actually there was music. You can actually fire with spacebar instead of having to work your way around control and alt. And we uh, speak. And uh, before before we get off three. Um I just want to talk about what did you think about the the pogo stick mechanic in that first game? In the first game? Yeah. Um did it feel a little bit um a little bit shaky to you at all? A little bit, but I think that had more to do with jumping in general in the first 3 games was shaky. Yeah. Because was... we're so we're so used to platformers like side scrolling platforming games like you run and as soon as you press the jump button off your character goes but this was something i noticed in my replay in the first in like commander keen's 1 through free, through 3 it's one of those games where there's just a pause before there's a jump right there's there's a little bit of it's, compa- it's comparatively more realistic but it makes like it makes the game a lot less you know smooth to control. Yeah, there, there there's definitely some wind up to Keen's movement. He accelerates and decelerates. There's a little, as you mentioned, there's a little bit of a pause before a jump. And yeah, um, it does it? Do, it did kind of make like just sort of having to change direction in mid air, like a lot more of a chore. Like I'm pretty sure the majority of the deaths that I experienced in the first three Keen games had less to do with, you know, getting killed by enemies, more just like, you know, taking a jump of faith and then being unable to like, you know, immediately oh, change direction in time before I fall into some spikes or something like that. Because that was another thing. You couldn't look up or down in those first three games. Right. So that was, that was another big, you know, probably mundane and retrospective, but incredibly important extra feature 
that came with four, five, and six. So you said you did beat the first one. Ah, uh, yes, I did. Did you find the secret level? I'm no, I did not. Without cheats? No. No. Nope. Okay. It was. Uh, I did it all but without cheats. I, yeah. I do not remember how. Because like because I know because disclo- I do remember disclosure. there are cheat codes and I, I used them at one point, but. I I have a ev- I have I did eventually go back and was like okay I'm I'm going to try to beat it yeah kosher this full, time full disclosure we did beat all of the games with cheats just because we were thinking like uh we're, we're revisiting these games right. we need, I want to see we, the plot we need to see the end it's been years this time around I was trying to do it completely you know completely clean right although I was like you know mashing that quick save quick load a lot so it's not entirely clean yeah that's that's the thing about the f- the first games is that the save functionality was a lot more limited right in that you could only save between levels on the overworld mm. and uh this is probably an influence of being a dos program but you had to Pick a number one through nine, and this will be your save slot. Yeah, and you'd you'd better remember you'd better remember yeah. which number it was. Yeah, you'd better remember which number you assigned to which save slot you were using. Mm-hmm. You have no way of, and you have no way of knowing if the save slot you're about to save to is already occupied. Right. There's also that. So when you finally move on to four, that's a bit of an improvement mm-hmm. because you can actually you've got you've only got. Six save slots now, but you can give them names. Right, and you can save in the middle of a level, including in the as you're just about to hit uh, something that will kill you. Uh, touching very briefly onto Keen Dreams, the uh, in between between uh, episode three and four, I didn't play it all that much. Like I've been trying to replay through it as. Um, like you know, as I as I've been going, I only really seriously played through it when they did the Steam re-release. I don't think it really compares to, like I can see where it's like a prototype for four, five, and six's engine, but I don't think it really compares, like in terms of quality, just because, you know, for all for 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 so I mean, switching for so much the, that you know they've added yeah. to it. There's also a lot missing that they wouldn't you know, add back into it until 4, 5, and 6. Like, for one thing, you don't you The whole conceit of Keen Dreams is that it's all happening in Keen, in uh, Billy Blaze's dream world. So he doesn't have his pogo stick. He doesn't have his stun gun. Yeah, the uh, flower power mechanic where you get these pellets you can throw at enemies and it will temporarily turn them into from uh, a menacing vegetable into a harmless flower. As we mentioned, Tom Hall's inclusion uh, to pacify uppity parents. But it was weird because now you've got a completely different weapon that has different mechanics because it's a bit of an arced projectile instead of straight ahead. If you miss, you can actually pick up your shot and throw it again if you're quick enough. On top of that, like it's an arced projectile that you have a very limited amount of because, like, something I noticed in all the other games, you could just get, you could just get blaster shots. You could get blaster ammo just sort of infinitely. I mean, after after a while, the screen would say 99, but it would keep, you know, continue to keep track after that. While here, your your ammo is set strictly at 50, which I mean, maybe you know, it's probably kind of hubris to think that you're gonna need more than 50 at any point. But considering it's a game where enemies regularly respawn and aren't just completely taken out, like, that can probably get a little bit hectic. Also, it's a game where you can't look up or down, which, in a game with so many faith jumps in it, is not great. So, yeah, the addition of that in 4 is a major improvement. Yeah, and once again, just kind of a mundane improvement, but, you know, so just, like, just that so major all the same but yeah four like i definitely remember four being like yeah four was definitely one of the four i this is totally nostalgia saying but i definitely think four is the best of the entire franchise now yeah we started on a pc without a sound card right so we at first we were just listening to pc speaker beeps and bloops as had been the case for uh one through three. I remember for a time, like, once we got a computer with a Sound Blaster card in it, I still wanted to continue playing with the PC speaker sounds because I think I just, 
as a, at a, at that early an age, I was nostalgic for the PC speaker sounds. Right, and it's not like the Sound Blaster sounds were any were. It's not like they were any seriously realistic or anything. I think it was most of them were just an attempt to uh, use the if you were creating sound effects on a synthesizer, basically. Right. Because almost all of them, it's not like it's digitized sound. It's uh, an ad libs FM synthesis chip. It did have that very sort of, you know, similar to the Sega Genesis quality of that very tinny, sort of obviously sound blaster sound. Right. I believe that the Sega Genesis and the uh, ad lib use a very similar, if not the same, sound chip. Mm. Like the uh, AdLib uses the Yamaha YM... I want to say it's the YM2612, and the Genesis uses like the 3812. I'm not sure exactly what the difference is practically, but it meant that they were capable of producing largely the same sounds. I will say, um, like, 4 is definitely my favorite of the franchise... Six has the best music, though. Yes. Speaking as a musician, like four was the first one to utilize, you know, an actual soundtrack because the technology was there at that point. But the music that is used is like very, very simplistic and not. I mean, it's still it's still got its catchy parts, but it's like there was definitely a lot more effort put into episode six. Like for example, there's this one theme uh, that's a it's actually there's one level theme that's actually a very short loop. Right. It only takes uh, I, I'd estimate around 15 seconds before it starts playing from the top again. Mm. It's that 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 kind of gloomy sounding one, and it's used in a lar- very large number of levels. It's used in yeah. It's used in all uh, of the couple of the pyramids, a couple of the couple of the ice levels, uh, ice all levels. of the. All of the island levels. It's interesting you say 15 seconds, because I remember that loop actually being a lot shorter. But maybe I just didn't pick yeah, up. Yeah, I'm probably I'm probably exa- uh, oh, I'm probably overestimating there. Like, I'll, I'll put in a clip in post-production, but... It's literally just a clip of dun, 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 dun. and I don't really remember there being any other sort of, you know, variation to it. There's like a slight variation on the second loop around and then it's right back to the beginning again. That made it like so interesting, you know, when I found when I did my research and learned that this was made with the iMuse software because that was an incredibly you know, complicated and advanced piece of uh, yeah, because if you, you know, if sa- you, of sound tracking software for the time. Because if you compare it to the kind of things that were happening in, um, in the um, Lucas Arts point and click adventure right, just games, compare the music of Commander Keen to the music of say Monkey Island Two, where, which shows off uh, the use of the iMuse system in the very first area, the town of Wood Tick, and you can see as you send Guybrush walking around where various musical themes are fading out and other sub-themes fading in very smoothly. And there's none of that in Commander Keen 4, so... Yeah, definitely going to definitely gonna be doing an episode on the point... on, like, either Monkey Island or the, punk, or the point-and-click adventure games in general, for sure. But then, yeah, you, you get to uh, episode 6, and there's... At least twice as many different level themes, and they're a lot more musically interesting. Right, and I will also just say, as uh, a big fan of like industrial music and dark techno, I fucking love the uh, that one sort of musical motif. Um, the one that comes to mi- like the one level that comes to mind is Blugton Manufacturing. Blugton Manufacturing, Blug Foods. I think those are the. I don't know if those are the only two where it is, but. It's this very sort of, like, sound blaster piece of industrial-sounding music that sounds like an assembly line, and it just sounds so rad. Yeah, it really takes advantage of the kind of... It's probably the best use you can put at that kind of FM synthesizer. But yeah, we, we just kind of completely skipped over the fifth game. Um, wait, did we, did we even say what the premise of the fourth game was? Uh, yeah, I don't think we did. So the, 
the fourth game, uh, Keen is apparently now has a, a radio that can read uh, transmissions from anywhere in the galaxy, and he hears like a uh, some kind of a, a rally being held uh, in favor of this being called the Ganalek, and the the uh, people praising the Ganalek is the race called the Shikadi, who apparently have a device that can blow up the entire galaxy. So, well, that's dangerous. Now I've got to go and find that and shut it down. But where to begin looking? So, apparent, I, it's never quite explained, but Keen apparently knows that there is an oracle on Gnosticus IV, which uh, he must have discovered in between uh, his other exploits going to the planet of the Vorticons and saving Earth. Or he just kind of knew about it. Yeah. So he goes, he seeks out the Oracle only to find out that the uh, council members that operate the Oracle have all been kidnapped and uh, hidden in various dungeons throughout the Shadowlands of Gnosticus IV. So, okay, need to go and rescue all eight of them. And that's that's your mission for that game, to just go through the game and rescue each individual council member. Who are hidden in a, who are hidden in specific levels, and uh, with with that in mind, that kind of takes some of the challenge out of the game once you know definitive. Because when you start the game, if you've never played it before, you don't know where because where all eight of them are situated. After the first couple of levels, you're like, okay, some of the levels will end without finding a council member, and some of them will. So I don't have to finish every level, but I don't know which ones are the essential ones. Right, so it's going through the same thing that uh, it's kind of going through the same thing that the third episode did, in that not every level is you know necessary to beat the game. There is kind of a there is kind of a funny Easter egg in that game, though. Um, there's a level that you can unlock in one of the pyramid levels. Right, this one also has a secret level, which I is want, I want to say I I want to say it was the Pyramid of the Forbidden. Was right, the name that's the it. name of it. Um, this is... And it is significantly harder. Yes, this is by far the hardest level in the entire game. It, like, I had to quick save, quick load a lot in order to get through it. And then you get to the... You, you reach the end of it, and there's a council member, and you're thinking, oh my god, there's a council member I can rescue. And you get to them, and he's just the janitor. Yeah, even though he's dressed completely the same. And, uh... Keen very clearly registers his dissatisfaction at the situation. Yeah. As best one can with EGA art. Um, but anyway, after the fourth one comes the fifth one, in which uh, the premise of that one is Keen. Um, the premise of that one is after learning about the location of the Armageddon machine from the rescued council members, he basically docks his ship to it and just sort of busts in in order to destroy it from the inside by once again destroying a bunch of reactors. Which this one also has kind of a funny Easter egg, which I wasn't able to find during like my recent playthrough of the fifth one, but I know of it. Um, basically, if you destroy a special reactor on a hidden level, at the end of the game, the Shikadi, the race that's responsible for running the Armageddon machine, basically hightail it out of there and attempt to escape using escape rockets. If you miss this level, then they just escape unfazed. If you manage to get it, they can't start their rocket ship, and they got a ticket for double parking. And, uh, yeah, this involved... So, there are four levels uh, on the Omega-Matic, the Armageddon machine, that um, where the, to beat the level, you need to break these fuses on these uh, four pieces of machinery, which... It's not you, it's not made immediately clear how you break the fuses either. Right. You it, Eventually, you figure out that you have to uh, jump on them with your pogo stick, and that... Uh, which is... It's good that they're expanding the use of the pogo stick beyond just, oh, here's an extra high jump, but it also uh, decreases your control over your character. You could use the pogo stick to kill some enemies in 4 though. Yes, that was an, and when that was an I, And when touch. I say some enemies, I just mean the one. Just enemy. the one, yes. The flies. But yeah, they don't make that like obvious from the start, and I feel like those who had memories of the second episode where you could just shoot them might be kind of confused at first before registering. Well, actually maybe not because they were positioned in such a way that's it's kind of impossible to shoot them to begin with. Right. There are these. They are uh, 
positioned between. Except, no, that's not true. Except no, that's not true either because you can shoot downward. True, but it, 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 now that I think about it, that they are the design of the machines is such that there's these big columns of equipment on either side, and they're positioned several of them vertically. So it that's so I, I guess that's good game design, kind of making people think. Okay, they're all in a row, upwards and downwards. So like it's just sort of drawing the eye towards it. Yeah, something like that. And also, uh, we haven't talked about standard galactic yet, but if you have been paying attention and you can un and uh, and you can understand standard galactic, I believe that they say uh, there's a sign that says fragile. Mm -hmm. So that's a clue right there. And yeah, this standard galactic alphabet, which is a motif throughout the games, it does like have a legit, you know, symbol to letter translation. Like, I, I don't know it. I believe in the original game design, when they were still in designing it, they had actual exit signs that said, you know, exit in Latin script. And Tom Hall looked at that and said, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem alien enough. So with a little bit of fiddling with a uh, pixel art editor, he removed various parts of letters and said, oh, that's a little bit better. Maybe I can expand this into an entire thing. Because you'll notice that the glyphs for e x i t it it looks as if you took the the letter the latin letters e x i t and just remove a handful of pixels and that's how you get the uh standard galactic glyphs for that i do wonder like how much of that was tom hall cuz i'm sure he came up with the idea and how much of that was adrian carmack cuz like tom hall was responsible for like you know much of the design and creative aspect of it but you know, Adrian Carmack was the main graphic designer for the whole thing, basically. I'm sure he had a hand in this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I will say, getting back to number five, um, it is just so incredibly satisfying. Not just, you know, when you break them with your pogo stick, but when you manage to get all three in one jump. Right, there's, uh, there's one of them that has four, and going through all four of them at once is pretty satisfying, yeah. Oh, yes. And it's kind of revisited in a way in the final level of the game where you've got to destroy the main reactor to deactivate the Armageddon machine. So here you are. You've got this even bigger bulb that looks... Okay, that's a, that's also glass. I can probably pogo this. No? Well, what do I have to do? No, you cannot. It's like reinforced glass or something. Right. At the same time, though, a recurring enemy throughout the game has basically been these living bombs that follow you around, and when they get too close, they explode into shrapnel. Um, immediately before you hit the big reactor, there is just a room filled with, like, at least ten of these things that you have to finagle over to the reactor and explode without killing you, too. Right, and they are hidden behind, like, a complete set of key gems. So you see that and you think, why all the security? What's going on? Why do I... Why would I want to set all why would I want to set all of those loose? On my replay, like I managed to get the bomb over the reactor and explode. I still got hit with a shrapnel and was about to die, but by that point it was too late. The game registered that I'd beaten it. Oh, so you're yeah. cuz notably in 4 when Keen dies, he goes his uh, corpse goes flying off like a solitaire car. Right. That's the little death animation. Yeah, whereas in the original he had just kind of waddled around a little bit in place and then for some reason flew off the screen at an angle. Then he gets raptured. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was five. Like, as I mentioned, I don't think we played th five initially when we were younger. So it No, we didn't play I didn't I don't remember ember playing yeah, we didn't we never actually bought five. We played five well after its popularity had passed. Yeah. So it I like at least for me it doesn't hold the same kind of nostalgia factor that four and six did. Right. I believe it was after we, I believe it was after I first played it after I found it on an abandoned warehouse. It was site. still, it was still fun though. Yeah. But I still, I still think six is better. Oh yeah. Six, six is really good as well. Like four is my favorite. Six is definitely the second best for me. I'm like, I don't like, I don't believe six really had any kind of like, you know, new sort of gameplay elements added to it, but it probably didn't need it. The whole premise of it, the whole premise of six is uh, Keen is being babysat. Something distracts him, and while he's being distracted, uh, so the an alien race called the Blugs 
who, as we mentioned, Mike Wazowski with chicken feet. A buff, super buff Mike Wazowski. Yes. They kidnap the babysitter with the intent of eating her. Right. Which is kind of a flimsy reason for an entire race of people to kidnap one person. But then again, this uh, the whole series is arguably premised on rather flimsy reasons, so why not? That's true, that's true. And anyway, she's brought to the planet Fribulous Zax, where she's being held captive, and Keen follows suit in order to, you know, rescue her from it. And that's it. That's the basic premise of the game. Prevent your babysitter from being eaten by big green blob people. I mean, I guess if there was one new gameplay element that it added, um, there was a much there was much more of an emphasis on. I mean, th- actually, no. This is probably their equivalent of like the reactors or the council members and stuff like that. But certain levels held, like they didn't have exits so much as special items you had to collect in order to traverse certain areas of the game. Right. There were certain parts of the overworld that were impassable unless you found an item in a level. And again. Much like the council members, if you don't know where the things are, that's going to... Once you do know where the things are, it's going to considerably uh, shorten a full playthrough because you know where everything is. I remember that being very fun. It was very fun to play through on my recent replay, and that was another one that I was able to beat you know, without cheat codes, but again, mashing that quick save, quick load. It was the, This is probably something that I... That was, it was interesting that they had done this. Is ne- you now have enemies that will drop items. Oh wait, had that had that not been a thing in previous games? I don't recall if it. I don't think it ever had been in any of the previous games. But only just now you have the the blue glitz who are carrying uh, key gems. Right. So I guess that was a new thing that they added. And something else that I'm remembering now. Um, like, I mean, thinking about it now, that might not be the case because the version of Keen 5 that I played didn't have music attached to it, so I can't be sure. But I but I think Keen 6 might have been the first one to have a level with its own exclusive music that doesn't appear anywhere else in the game. Right, the final the final level had a, a level theme that was not used anywhere yeah. else. Yeah, and I don't mind telling you, like playing that as a single digit child, that level music scared the crap out of me. Right, yeah, it was very. Uh, it had a uh, this kind of ominous sounding theme. It had a Morse code message in the background. Did that actually translate to anything? Or I believe it did. I don't re- remember what it. I don't remember what it actually translated to, but it w- was actual valid Morse code. Mm, that's very cool. The rest of the music in 6 was really good, too. I think maybe that might have been like Bobby Prince finally, you know, figuring out, oh, I've got iMuse completely down at this point. Like, there weren't any overlapping sort of motifs like there were in, you know, the LucasArts games or anything like that, but... The music is just really well crafted and like really catchy. Yeah, know? I think it was, there's, I think it was the fact that he realized that he wasn't going to use any of the more complicated uh, transition features of iMuse and just focused more on creating a much better soundtrack. And you've got a lot more songs, and they're all really good, and of varied themes too. Where you've got like the, you mentioned the highly industrial sounding theme in Blug Foods and Blugton Manufacturing. Then you've got the very uplifting kind of... the the theme from uh, Blug Aeronautics and Space Administration and Blugton Towers. It's got, like, these kind the, of synthesized orchestral swells attached yeah, to it. It's very uplifting, very fitting for the kind of uh, pop, sci-fi... Uh, Ret- kind of like retro futuristic sci-fi theme to it. Bobby Prince, the composer, like he like he worked with uh, he ended up working with id software quite a bit moving forward from that and Apogee after they became 3D Realms. Like he's he's responsible for the he wrote the Duke Nukem theme song that's so iconic. Right, he's responsible for a lot of the music that is iconic to our childhood. I just queued up the uh, Wikipedia page for uh, Bobby Prince, 
Uh, some other game, like there's a lot of, on here that you know you might not recognize. I certainly don't recognize a lot of them, but some of the ones that stick out for me. He also composed uh, Apogee Games, Cosmos Cosmic Adventure, Major Striker, Bio Menace, Duke Nukem 2, uh, Blakestone Aliens of Gold, Doom, uh, Argo Ch- Hexagon. Oh man, I found Hex. I found Hexagon on the. Uh, they put a whole bunch of DOS games just up to play on archive.org and I spent so much time just whittling away hours playing right. Hexagon. How many, how many episodes do you think we could create just from things we found on Game Empire? That's what it was called, Game Empire. Two, yeah. Single CD, over 250 games, and I recall we found that in we were at Building that was, 19. Yeah, that was the one from Building 19. And it came as part of a 10 CD pack. That also had like a CD full of clip art and a CD full of fonts and a 90s almanac and various other things there. And I remember we were, we, we had pooled like together several weeks of allowance at the time and we were still kind of short. So we had to go to mom and dad and beg them to cover us the rest of the way. And they eventually agreed with uh, under the caveat like you you better get your you better get a lot of value out of this and I would say we've gotten more than oh, enough. Oh, totally. Out of that. There were how how many games in total were there? Like I actually went back and did a count, and there are just barely over two hundred and fifty games. Mm. I mean, at our age, that would have been more than enough to like capture our attention for a very long time. Like between all of the incredibly high quality shareware titles that were on there and just a lot of crap. Yeah. And that brings us to today, where we have no further Commander Keen news. Yes. But anyway, that's the story of the Commander Keen franchise. Uh, definitely recommend you go look them up if you're interested in any sort of, like, if you're interested in checking out an oft forgotten piece of gaming history. Like all, like all of the major, pretty much all of the major games are available either to purchase on Steam under the complete Commander Keen collection, or to download <coughs> legally on on like abandonware sites and things like that. If you can finagle, you know, DOSBox to work the way you want it yeah, to. Yeah, DOSBox is not really, it's not that complicated to operate. I'm sure you can find a. There's all kinds of tutorials. That could get you where you need to be on that. But anyway, uh, that about does it for this episode. Thank you very much for joining me, Glenn. Thank you for having me. And uh, until next time, uh, bye. Science.